Welcome to the Nursing Post podcast, All Nursing All the Time with Ashley Moore and Rosa Horsley. This podcast is not politically motivated. Its motivation is strictly patient advocacy and to bring awareness to the current medical issues and healthcare concerns. So with that being said, in this episode, we discuss healthcare for those detained at the border by CBP and ICE centers across the United States. Our goal is always to inform and to help start conversation. The degree of healthcare disparities in America continues to grow and widen amongst minorities. Recent events in the current pandemic compiled with civil unrest have it difficult to ignore, really. What happens when a demographic of people, Latinos and others, are publicly targeted? These demographics are not the only ones that migrate to America in hopes of a better life. Most people flee their countries in hopes of bettering their life and the lives of their families. Many flee as refugees fearing for their lives from kidnappings, trafficking, and even death. With the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement on high alert, detainees being held are at an all-time high. How does this impede and affect medical care received by those being held as detainees? So there's a little bit of statistics, of course. According to the federal government data from uh, April of 2019, the following are the top five states with the largest number of people in U.S. immigration detention centers this per day. Texas, which is... Uh, over 14,000, which is by far the highest. Absolutely. Louisiana is a little over 4,000. Arizona and California are both a little over 4,000. And Georgia right at 3,700. Approximately 55,000 immigrants are detained daily. That's huge. It's a big number. It costs the federal government $134 a day on average to maintain one adult detention bed. So that's according to ICE in 2018. However, the National Immigration Forum calculates at about at about $208 a day. So that's a little bit of a big difference. Um, they are, for one person, it's not a lot, but when you think 55,000 people are and detained a day, that. and then you multiply yeah. that, then that's a Ooh, lot of money. That's a lot of money. Each family uh, residential center bed which keeps like mothers and fathers with their children is about $319 a day, uh, according to the ICE budget. And ICE spends more than $250 million annually on healthcare services, which is kind of so surprising to me. Um, it's very surprising to me because $250 million is a lot of money. It is. So, it, this before I know anything and get into what I've learned in mm -hmm. researching for this topic, I would have thought because I don't think most of these detainees are held for long periods of time, like our prison sentences mm -hmm. are and things like that. I mean, there are extenuating circumstances, mm -hmm. but a lot of times, you know, they're kind of their whole route. goal is they're, to it, get it, it out it, it, to yeah. get to get them, you know, mm -hmm. deported back to their. Mm -hmm you know, country of origin or, you know, the proper way of getting them um, naturalized yes. citizens. Yeah. And so the, the idea is that they're just detained for a short period of time until one of the two things happen. So I would have thought that that's plenty to provide adequate health care because you're only doing this for a very temporary period. Um, as I learned more, I realized why this number um, it's not that it doesn't seem to be enough, but why it's not as impactful as it should be. Well, let me just do some number crunching here. My handy dandy calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it all the way back to Blue's Clues. Okay, $134 times 55000 Wow, that's $7,370,000. Okay, then we're going to round it up some because, you know, we have families in there, too. Yes. But then they get to spend 
million annually. So it should be enough. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, there are people that are detained that have nothing wrong with them medically. They need no medical help. Just like our insurance companies, there are outliers. There are people who are really, really sick. There are people who are not mm-hmm. sick at all. And then people who just need basic screenings just Every to make year. sure that nothing crazy is going on or going to happen in the foreseeable future. So, like I said, I mean, I thought... Well, let us find where, where the shortfalls are because after doing the math... <laughs> Right. $250 million should be enough and then some. Right. Okay. So medical care guidelines. The detention standard ensures that detainees have access to appropriate and necessary medical, dental, and mental health care. And that includes emergency services. So every facility shall directly or contractually provide its detainee population with the following. Initial medical mental and dental screening, medically necessary and appropriate medical, dental, and mental care and pharmaceutical services. They should also receive comprehensive routine and preventative health care as medically indicated. Emergency care, specialty care, timely responses to medical complaints, hospitalization as needed within the local community staff or professional language services necessary for detainees with limited English proficiency during any medical or mental health appointment, sick call, treatment, or consultation. So, so just basic health care. Basic health care, I mean, everyday, run of the mill yep. nursing, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. no, nothing in here seems crazy. No, and it's not like, ex- you know, anything extra that no, we wouldn't it's expect. Just basic human care. Yep. So I think this kind of has opened my eyes. I had a really difficult time researching this topic for me specifically. Um, I don't really know why I haven't been able to like really put a finger on it, mm-hmm. but it, it was a tough one for me. And I think it's because as a nurse, I just think you should just take care of the person that's in front of you to the best of your ability. And I think it's a hard pill for me to swallow that some people don't do that. So... My thought was that we need a better understanding of immigrant medicine, which is actually a thing. It is. It exists. I didn't know it was a thing. There's plenty of different kinds of medicines out there that I don't know is a thing. So this is not like, you know. This is definitely not a polka dotted elephant. Right. This this is a real thing. Yes. So uh, it is not required by law to report immigration status and health care. That's the first thing I want to get out there. Mm -hmm. Evidently, that is something that doctors, nurses, any medical professionals can get confused about. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make that clear because that, for some reason, is a really gray area. Undocumented immigrants are covered by HIPAA. And that really should take care of any questions or thoughts that you have. Mm -hmm. It does not matter who you're taking care of. They are covered by HIPAA. Well, HIPAA is meant to protect the privacy of the patient. So it is a very good idea that if somebody comes to you asking you questions about a patient and it doesn't matter if it's somebody from law enforcement, ICE, the DOJ... The president. It does not matter. (laughs) Unless they have a signed HIPAA with that person's name on it, they don't get information, including immigration status, even if that patient disclosed that information to you. That's important. That's not only important for nurses, but it's also important for the immigrant population to understand because yes. this is a barrier that keeps them from actually seeking medical care because they're afraid of being deported if they come to the emergency room yes. for medical care. They think that somebody there is going to pick up the phone and call, and call ICE to call come, ICE get to come get them. And that is illegal. You can't do you that. Violated you have violated HIPAA. Your patient's HIPAA if you've done that. So let's just, I, that's the first thing I wanted to get out of the way. Just because I thought it was, I just read article after article after article. And a lot of it was 
um, like clerical type people mm-hmm. who were like, oh, they're not documented. We have to call somebody. No. No. So even if you know this as whatever you are, nurse, doctor, provider, nothing Just in the medical the street. Yeah, nobody in the medical field. That's not your place. Period. So. Well put. So there are federal and state privacy laws that provide protection that firm, that further limit the disclosure of patient information, including immigration status related information to law enforcement officials. Um, so that's from the DOJ. So no, that's a, that's a hard no. Um, in the United States, we have the largest wave of immigration and since the beginning of the 20th century. So we need to understand that we have a, uh, our country is very eclectic and we need to make sure that we have an open mind to make sure that we're covering all of our bases in medicine. Absolutely. Because there are so many different moving parts to treating patients. You just have to understand that we may see diseases here in, in, you know, North America that we are not familiar with. And so we just have to take that into consideration. Um, there may be lack of immunizations from, from immigrants from other countries. If Well, Medicare medical standards are not the same everywhere in the world. In the world. Yeah. And so that's important to keep in mind if you're, you have an immigrant who is your, your patient. Right. And then one of the biggest things, and this should be a given, is language barriers. Mm. It is our job to find a translator, not the patients. Say that again for me. It is our job to find translators, not the patients. And this is anywhere in healthcare. I don't care what language your patient speaks. It is not their job to find a translator, immigrant or not undocumented documented citizen i don't it doesn't matter if they are deaf it's your job to find somebody who speaks sign language if that's what they speak if they speak spanish it is your job to find a spanish interpreter that can uh, that can interpret that patient and understand what you're saying back to them so there are people that specialize in that and that is our job that's what we are paid to do is to make sure that we can give adequate health care and that's part of it there are some things to consider we need to respect patients' autonomy by providing immigrant patients with complete information on their illnesses and treatment options and any kind of societal limitations regarding those options. Mm-hmm. Use an interpreter where necessary and offer culturally competent care by understanding cultural differences that may bear on patient understanding, perception, and decision making. And this isn't only for the Latino population. There are cultural differences in nursing that we have to be aware of. Yes. Period. Yes. There are religious groups who do not, you know, receive blood products. Correct. And that's an important piece of information to know. It is. We should be doing our due diligence to make sure that we're educated and up to date. That's That seems simple, but it's... Not, I know. Be mindful of the hospital's ethical duty to act in the patient's best interest, regardless of their ethnicity, race, or ability to pay for care. Understand state law regarding treating undocumented immigrants. Hospitalists can legally care for these immigrants with emergency and stabilization treatments, which we've talked about already. Yes. Be aware of the tension between the hospitalist's obligation to act in the patient's best interest versus the legal and fiscal constraints that sometimes mandate no treatment. Regardless if they have health insurance, regardless, you know, if they speak the language, if they show up for care, don't deny it. You're not supposed to, period. Keep in mind that the hospitalist's ethical obligations to contribute some time and care to charity and to advocate to institutions for equitable treatment for those in need. Do the right thing for Pete's sakes. Right. And so that's kind of what, that's part of the oath that we take as healthcare providers is it's not 
supposed to be about the money. It's supposed to be about treating the patient. You know, if I stop on the side of the road because somebody's having a heart attack because I feel ethically that I'm a nurse and no CPR and that I need I to do to that, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be reimbursed for that. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You shouldn't be. If you're looking at your patients as if they're dollar signs, then you're in the wrong field. Amen. You need to choose another field yesterday. Yep. It's a basic human right to receive medical care in the United States, no matter your race, color, language, sex, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Basically, everybody deserves care. Yes. It's a human right. Yeah. I try to cover... No, you hit it. Most of it. Oh, yeah. You got it all. (laughs) Like, I don't think you left anything. And that's what people need to hear. Right. And help undocumented immigrants by giving them information to health community centers that bring help to underserviced areas. There are a lot of community centers that can help with all kinds of things, medical and even like housing and food. Like they are a huge resource. Utilize them, you know, and it, I'm not trying to be funny, but like a quick Google search can open up a whole different world and, that's part of the care of the patient, in my opinion, with regards to nursing. Absolutely. I think a lot of times we forget, you know, about our community centers, our local churches. Any religious affiliation. Yeah. All of them usually have something or have a tie somewhere or can get you Where additional you to go. help. Yeah. You know, it may be, you know, as we would say, like going down a rabbit hole, <laughs> but eventually you're going to come up you find something and that's huge another thing that we can do to help with immigrant medicine is explain even to undocumented immigrants how to get access to health care and actually make them feel better about enrolling so again insurance providers are still are mandated to follow HIPAA as well So they cannot release any information. And if so, that's illegal. And um, undocumented immigrants can buy private insurance if they can afford it. Yeah. I mean, I know that's a whole, that's a, that's a whole other issue, but they have the right if they wanted to, I mean, I can name off 20 agencies that offer health insurance, call them up and get private. Um, So that's, if you can Something pay it, they're of. definitely not going to turn you down. Right. Another thing to consider is county and state programs are not considered a public charge and therefore do not impact a patient's ability to adjust immigration status in the future. What's a public charge, Ashley? Yes. So I did not know what a public charge was, um, which is why I have the definition In case any of you all don't know what a public charge is. Drop some knowledge. (laughs) A public charge is an individual who will likely become, quote, primarily dependent on the government for substance as demonstrated by either the receipt of public cash assistance for income maintenance or institutionalization for long-term care at government expense, end quote. And in other words... You can't really get government assistance, period. You can't get Medicare, Medicaid. You can't get, like, food stamps, housing assistance, things like that. So there's a big difference between what you can and can't get as an undocumented undocumented immigrant because if you become considered a public charge, which means you're using our government as a means to be able to be here, that makes you ineligible to try to become a citizen. Yeah, a documented citizen. So uh, if an immigrant is a public charge, of course, it would go against them in the future when they try to become documented. And therefore, a lot of undocumented immigrants try to not seek any care for fear that it will hurt them in the future, which is kind of sad. It's a shame. It's a shame. I understand that there's a lot of ins and outs and... Mm -hmm. 
It's a very hot topic right now. Yeah, um, you know, when it comes to who's going to pay for this, who's going to pay for that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if we know this is an issue, then I feel like we should start working on a solution. Mm-hmm. Instead of just saying that the public charge thing is an issue. Like, maybe there's a secondary route to go. And that's where understanding that they can that uh, undocumented immigrants can get insurance it just has mm-hmm. to be private it's private uh-huh. the government's not going to support you because you're not you know a citizen. a citizen of the united states and we get that and i feel that most people that come here don't come here looking for a free handout i, I feel like the people who come here are coming here to try to make a better life for their family sure. and realize that they have to work for that yes so maybe we should find a good middle ground. Exactly. Maybe we should be doing things to help assist in that. Yes. So found an interesting article that highlights specifically deaths while in ICE custody. And it actually had a drop from um, nearly 12% in 2004 to 2.3% in 2018. So the deaths in ICE custody have are trending down. And as of right now, 2019 is not listed, which is why we don't have those because I can't find them. However, you know, it's they're thinking it's following a downward trend. trend. Uh, they think this is a part to three different things. One being that the length of time that immigrants spent in detention actually has decreased, which means they no matter their care that they've gotten, they were in and out so fast that death wasn't a consequence. Mm-hmm. The second is that ICE increasingly relied on secure communities and local law enforcement to first arrest illegal immigrants before they were transferred to ICE. And the local law enforcement pretty much were handling health care needs before they were sent. Mm-hmm. Or they didn't make it out of... yeah their detention center i guess they didn't make it out of um prison or jail before they got to the ice detention center and the third is that we've improved some of the medical policies during this time to where it's the issues aren't resulting in death there are things worth worse than death in my eyes as a nurse for sure absolutely just I mean, every life is I feel is like I precious. needed to throw that out yeah. there. Like, every life is precious. Don't get us wrong. But if, you're, if your quality of life is absent, that's, I think that's the point you're trying to make. Yeah. If your quality of life is absent, is it life? Are you living at that no, point? No, you're just existing, in my humble opinion. <laughs> And one of the biggest reoccurring themes in the articles that I've read, which I've read a lot, and I feel like everyone has some kind of agenda attached to it, honestly. Mm -hmm. But the reoccurring theme is there is a huge lack of adequate staffing in these detention centers. And this is for healthcare. We're specific on healthcare here. Like, it's a problem in healthcare, period. Yes. In general, period. But it's even more so. Well, there's a bigger problem here. It's underlining. And what that is, is I could go there as an LPN, and I would almost be expected to work, not necessarily in the capacity of maybe an RN, but almost in the capacity of a nurse practitioner Mm -hmm. where they would, you are really pushed outside of your scope tremendously. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is a deadly combination when you don't have good staffing and then the staff that you do have are out practicing outside of their scope of practice immensely. That is, that's bad medicine. That is dangerous medicine. With the increase of ICE detainees since the current president-elect, news articles have been published describing the inhumane treatment and the lack of appropriate medical care that detainees have received. 
Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill in 2018 require ICE to make public all reports regarding an in-custody death within 90 days. An article published in Politico in December 2019 entitled Black Hole of Medical Records Contributes to Death Mistreatment at the Border said that 22 deaths of detainees in immigration customs enforcement custody happened between 2013 and 2018 revealed malfunctioning software and troubling gaps in the use of technology such as failure to properly document patient care or scribbling documentation in the margins of forms so basically these 22 deaths between that five-year period was because of errors. Yeah. Like, that's the only way I can take that. That's from errors. Yep. People not documenting, and then literally people not being able to read Scribble Scrabble. Yep. Recent reports indicate that the Customs and Border Patrol rejected a CDC recommendation to administer flu shots to people in its custody. Two children later died of the flu in the agency's facilities. This is ridiculous. I want to know where that $250 million is going to that we can't give the flu shot. Mm, I'm going to tell you. It's coming up. Whew, okay. Patients suffered from delays in medical care, refusals to accommodate disabilities, and nearly consistent isolation. So not only did they not receive the medical care that they needed, and not only were their disabilities refused to be accommodated, on top of all that, now you're isolating them? Many immigrants abandoned their fight for the American dream due to living in unbearable conditions compounded by untreated medical conditions. You got to think about this for a second. Really? Like, seriously? You fled here, right? For your life and the life of your family, thinking that you were going to make things better. Not only that, but like even before that, you're, you're leaving somewhere, wherever. Wherever, wherever you're coming from, you're coming here. These people are traveling sometimes on foot Mm -hmm. without food or water for extended periods of time, hiding in places that most people here would not even dream of. Mm -hmm. And just to get here, but they're leaving our detention centers because of how poorly they're being treated. Or how poorly they feel. Like, really let that sink in. Like, all the crap they went through to get here. And that was better than how they're being held. That's crazy to me. That's crazy. That's insane that we are treating human beings Mm -hmm. worse than we treat animals for sure. Because if you're letting them live in squalor, I don't know how many people let their pets live that way. It's it's so demeaning and dehumanizing. It makes me sick. So some of these ta- detainees tend to go back to their countries. They've attempted to escape because living in the U.S. is worse. Healthcare providers rely on medical records that are partial, incomplete, or unreadable. Mm-hmm. So their health care that they're getting here is so substandard. It's so substandard. When you have a patient and there's no medical history, no background, nothing, there's not even a file to say, here's your next patient. They're in room one or whatever there's nothing there Mm -hmm. nothing there doctors who care for patients say they frequently arrive without documentation i find this interesting since each detainee is supposed to receive a comprehensive medical dental and mental health intake screening no later than 12 hours after they arrive at each detention facility 
And on top of that, each detainee shall have a comprehensive health assessment, including a physical exam, a mental screening by a qualified licensed healthcare professional no later than 14 days after entering into ICE custody or arrival at a facility. So tell me how that you have patients without any medical records when you're supposed to have a comprehensive medical, dental, and mental health intake screening no later than 12 hours after arriving at a detention center. Yeah, it's, they're not being done. That's what that tells me. Somet- if it ain't documented. It's not done. Nursing 101, hello. Sometimes providers receive a combination of scanned paper records and some printouts from a med- electronic medical records. So they have an EMR system. They're not even using it. Half the stuff is scanned in, half the stuff's not there, and half the stuff is scribbled on paper somewhere. There, now there, I'm starting to get a very clear picture and no doubt in my mind as to why they're not receiving adequate care. Even if somebody is there to care for them, they don't How really they know, know what to do going on. And really, do we have all the translators there that need to be there to... Probably not. ...really get a good assessment from the patient? Probably not. So, <sighs> administration's public charge rule, which would deny uh, migrants green cards if they, pub- if they use public insurance or welfare programs, it kind of causes a little bit of a gap or a roadblock, I guess is really mm-hmm. the better term to use. Um, Many non-governmental physicians who care for refugees and immigrants decline to enter their records into the computer out of concern that this, that their data, that their healthcare records will be, will be used by authorities to refuse assistance or otherwise discriminate against them. Mm -hmm. That's awful. And what does that tell you if physicians who completely understand HIPAA are so like, well, if I want to document this. Even though DHS and ICE have electronic health records, it's, it's they're still a, it's a huge issue. Like Absolutely. it's not because they're refusing to document the care. And there's room for improvement with these immigration detention centers. Um, as long as people are dying, there's ways to make it better. I compare the deaths of detainees in ICE centers with the death of prisoners in our correctional facilities in the United States. 2.3 out of 100,000 detainees die in immigration centers. And 303 out of 100,000 prisoners will die while incarcerated. So while there's definitely room to improve our ICE centers' um, medical care, they are seemingly doing a better job than our correctional facilities uh, for our prisoners, which is an interesting side of this. However, there are many detainees that are being held that are not getting adequate care and are suffering from disease and mental illnesses. And I think one of the biggest problems as to why the death rate is lower but yet the problem with medical issues are higher is because many sites that house detainees are for profit and so if you need any kind of medical attention as a detainee that cost is directly associated with the facility. The facility is responsible for paying that because they're getting money from the government Mm -hmm. to hold that detainee. Makes sense. But that ultimately de-incentivizes the facility to care for the patients adequately. do the right thing. So they have to report deaths within 90 days. That's a law that's mandated by our government. But they don't have to report anything else within healthcare that I could find. Could you, did you read anything in any of the articles that you can remember? No, um, they have made recent changes and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But before those changes were implemented, 
I can't say that I could find anything. Right. So I think what happens is they kind of take that care down as far as they can Mm -hmm. without causing death, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Because things just don't align properly otherwise. Like, the deaths are lower. And that's mm-hmm. that's great. We're not killing people. However, and I mean, some people are going to die from incidents. Our, that shouldn't be our standard. Well, well yeah, no, I understand that. <laughs> and I understand that people are going to die and it has nothing to do with the people that are taking care of them. Yeah. Like, sometimes things, like, freak things happen. Yeah. Like, somebody d- dies of an aneurysm yeah. that ruptured and nobody knew that they had an aneurysm. Or, you know, there are extenuating circumstances. That's true. And I understand that. So, but some of the pictures that I've seen of these facilities, I mean, they that was gross. They do live in squalor. I mean... I- Articles after article after article, I've read that they may have been able to wash their hands literally twice, three times a week. Some people hadn't showered literally in over two months because it's so overcrowded right? that they are literally stacked on top of each other. Right. There are pictures that you can find on the internet of children sleeping on the floor, literally, like little sardines in a can yeah. with tin foil blankets on concrete floors trying to keep themselves warm. Yep. They live in squalor. Yeah. It's- Our prison system at least, you know, gives, you a, gives you a cot and maybe max of four people in the cell. But, I mean, these people don't even have the luxury to take showers, to wash their hands, to comb their hair. I mean, it's ridiculous. Personal, just yes, personal, personal hygiene. hygiene. So we're going to talk a little bit about barriers and what is kind of in the way in regards to proper treatment. So last year there was an article which, of course, we always link our references and the articles we read to our website. A whistleblower had come forward with these complaints of inadequate medical care for seven children in custody that had had died. So in December 2019, Congress launched an investigation because of the accusations made by the whistleblower I'm just going to highlight, you know, two of the seven children, but all children are important, not just the two I'm going to highlight. Absolutely. You know, all of these seven children, all of the people that have died while in detention, they're important. So Hakleen Ka'al and Felipe Gomez Alonso were the first children to die in ICE custody in over 10 years. They were detained in Alamogordo, New Mexico. In July 2020, a committee hearing met to clarify the breakdown in their medical care and the measures on how to prevent further deaths from happening with children in custody. This is actually um, a publicized video hearing that I took two and a half hours to watch. So it's out there on the web, and of course, we'll link it to our site so that you can watch it yourself. (laughs) Here are the highlights from that two and a half hour um, breakdown meeting. Custom Border Patrol officers were not medically trained, but were performing medical intake checklists. So all they had was their CPR certification, which Almost anybody to be in serving a public sector or in a public sector has to have basic life-saving skills, period, anyway. Right. So you have someone who only has a certificate in CPR. That doesn't count. Taking medical (laughs) assessments, pretty much. I don't want to downplay CPR is a wonderful thing. It saves lives. It does not make you a medical professional. At all. In any way, shape, or form. At all. 
there were no medical personnel performing these intake assessments. There were never any vital signs taken at the time of intake. And the intake checklist that we're, discuss, that we're discussing right now was not even done in private. It was done in front of everybody else who's in line waiting to be detained at the center. No privacy whatsoever. And then on top of that, these two children in particular, both of their families spoke indigenous languages. So even though their families may have come from South America, they didn't really speak Spanish as a first language. That's a stereotype. I mean, it just keeps the it just keeps getting worse every time I try to like rationalize this in my head somehow. And then it's just like one more thing that says, oh, my God, are you serious right now? Right. No, just because you're from a certain area doesn't mean you speak a certain language. So Custom Border Patrol has challenges in providing real time interpreter services for some of the languages that these detainees speak. And I could see that. Even if they try, they may not be able to find anything. But you have to at least make the effort. Very true. Right? You have to at least make the effort. You shouldn't assume everybody that crosses the border only speaks Spanish. I can assure you 200,000% certainty that not everybody that's in this country illegally is Latino. I mean, I'm just saying. No. Just saying. Detainees are afraid and they're confused by the role of ICE. Sometimes they confuse this as police being arrested, deported on the spot. So they will withhold some of the medical issues and information that they're going through in fear of being sent back to the place where they were trying to escape from. Right. So if they come in with, I don't know, diabetes, may, they're maybe not going to tell you that because that's an added expense. Right. And they're afraid that because they need insulin, you're going to send them right back to where they came from. The CDC recommendation to vaccinate for influenza for six month olds and above was denied, like we mentioned earlier in 2019. In August of 2019, the CBP straight out said that it wasn't giving the flu shots to the thousands of migrants that are now in the detention centers. Not only does that affect the people that are in the detention centers as detainees, but that affects the people who work there. Absolutely. Like, newsflash, if I work as a nurse at a place, even if I get my flu shot, if I walk into a center that's overcrowded and flu gets in there, then I'm probably still going to get the flu. The flu. I mean, it's a vaccine, not a miracle shot. It's not a cure. It's a vaccine. Just to throw that in. So what came out in this um, news briefing, you know, video conference was that Felipe had tested positive for influenza B on his first trip to the emergency room. He ended up dying of sepsis on his second trip to the emergency room that same day. That baffles me. So where, what happened in that emergency room that that patient was sent home or back to the detention center instead of being admitted? Because obviously they were sick. Most definitely. and I'm not trying to be funny. No, not at all. And kids can go from zero to hero pretty quick, and I understand and that. that. Was one of the that was one of the comments that were made in the conference, you know, about these findings. Doctors said, you know, children present differently. They do. Like, they can be 
at 10 or, you know, 10 all day, like out of scale one ten, they can be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and then literally in an instant tank. Yes. And that's very true. But that goes to show me that there's a big disconnect because I'm a nurse and I know that. I know, and I think a lot of nurses know, kids go from zero to hero. That's one of the reasons why I don't really like working with kids. Yeah. I love kids. I have kids. I don't want to care for kids. They don't understand that what you're mm-hmm. doing is going to eventually help them. They just know that you're hurting them. It's completely understandable. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just kind of, you know, ow, that hurts. I don't want you to do that. Well, I kind of put this IV in you to give you medicine. They don't understand yeah. that. I mean, and that's kids that speak the same language yes. as me. So, to have somebody that doesn't look like you, that doesn't speak your language, who can't comfort you very well because they can't speak your language, and then they're poking and prodding at you, that, like, that has got to be scary. terrifying for a kid. Absolutely. And so, that would be terrifying for me as an adult, but what are you doing? What are you doing? And you can't even comfort them in the way of saying... I'm helping you. I'm going to make you, this is going to make you feel better. This is going to hurt, but I'm going to put medicine to make mm-hmm. you feel better. So, I mean, all these things just go through my head and I'm just like, why? Something was missed. And then if they had proper care at the detention center, then a nurse would have known, well, hold on. If this kid, we need to keep a close eye because kids go, you know, what yeah. I say from zero yeah, to hero, hero in a second, in a quick mm-hmm. minute. And you got to be able to get them to the right spot. It breaks my heart because these two families, along with the other, you know, five children and every, the 22 people who have lost their life within those years that we discussed, all of this was preventative. I haven't even gotten to the end of the finding, so I'll come back and we'll sum it up with how all of this could have been prevented. The transfer delays were an issue that were brought out during this conference. Customs and Border Protection is supposed to only detain for 72 hours or less. But these children were detained longer, causing belief that they caught the flu while they were in custody. So, Because nobody was vaccinated. Exactly. Just saying. So not only did we have, you know, Jacqueline's family and Felipe's family coming to America, not receiving an adequate assessment during their intake. Vital signs were not taken. Both families did not speak English or Spanish as their primary language. Then on top of that, they were not given the flu shot and they were held for longer than the 72 hours that they were supposed to be held. It's like the perfect storm. It is. So how how can a detained parent advocate for their child that's being detained with them? And remember, at the beginning of this administration, children were being ripped away from their families. Right. So how are you supposed to, as a parent, advocate for your child? You can't. The moment that you step into detention... Your parent parental rights, they're pretty much terminated. That parent and that child are now the responsibility of the facility. And the facility failed them, failed all of these children, which is a shame. It is. It is not our place as nurses or healthcare providers to judge the persons that we're caring for. It is our job to provide the best care that we can with the information and resources that we have. And it has been proven time and time again that education and adequate care helps not only the person receiving care, but the system as well. The only thing that I can say about this, to sum it up, is I feel like if we, as a country, are holding people here, no matter, I don't care why it is, I don't care. If we are detaining a person, then it is our job to care for them to the best of our ability until they are no longer being detained. Yeah. Well, they're on American soil. They need to be treated with respect, respect and, and dignity. dignity. And that, ju- and if they're a bad person, because of course there are bad people trying to come here and do awful things 
And I understand that. But that is still not our place. We treat them in a way that I feel like we as Americans would say needed people need to be treated. We need to say, hey, I they can be the worst person in the world. Take care of them and then send them back home for their government to deal with them as they, they see, see fit. fit. Absolutely. And then we just start the process over again. You know, like not everybody who comes here that's an immigrant is trying to traffic drugs. Absolutely. That is... That's the, the worst stereotype I right. think I've ever heard. And I think that so many people think, oh, well, if they're here illegally, they're doing something wrong. No, that's not the case. It's not. The government in America that was founded supposedly on diversity and fleeing of persecution. Right. Has done a horrible job of continuing that. Because and now we're it's persecuting. always based on the fact that, well, there's bad people trying to get into our country. But to think that every person that comes here and they're not documented is a bad person is, a bad is, person is crazy. There are American citizens that are bad people. Amen. So to me, this is absolutely absurd. So that's why I say, and honestly, you don't know. So treat everybody, give them good care. And if we find out that they're a bad person and they've done something illegal, then that's for their government to handle with them. Not us. Not us. Just do the right thing. Do the right thing when nobody's watching and do it better when they are. Exactly. As always, we will link our references on our website, thenursingpostpodcast.com. We would love for you guys to join the conversation and leave your comments and or suggestions. You can subscribe to our podcast and listen to us on any platform that you prefer we are on social media so you can check us out there as well thank you guys for listening to the nursing post